Hello, my name is Alanson Sample. I'm a professor at the University of Michigan where I lead the Interactive Sensing and Computing Lab. And I'm going to give a talk on room scale wireless power delivery via quasi-static cavity resonance. So um, wireless power is becoming pretty commonplace. We have uh, toothbrushes that can be recharged if you put them on a cradle. And this is like 1D of charging, right? There's one point in space where this thing will get recharged. We also have charging pads, which gives us convenience to place our cell phone anywhere on the pad, giving us 2D charging. But I wonder, what happened to Tesla's vision? Where is 3D charging? Why can't I just walk into a space, have my cell phone recharge just in my pocket, just by walking into a space? And so Tesla had some uh, lots of great, crazy ideas, and one of them was to send uh, make a standing electromagnetic wave that would reverberate between the Earth and the ionosphere all around the planet delivering wireless power. And so we thought about this idea. What about standing waves? Can these be used for wireless power delivery? So we started with kind of a classic example. Here we're going to use cavity resonators. These are similar to waveguides to put standing electromagnetic waves in an enclosed structure. So our first experiment, experiments were with a five foot by six foot by four foot uh, chamber, and all, a metalized chamber, and we're able to fill it with magnetic fields and control the distribution of magnetic field, the orientation, um, the intensity, and the direction, or in the location of these magnetic fields by stimulating different electromagnetic modes. And we're also able to deliver power wirelessly to very small receivers anywhere within. And this was exciting because it was kind of the first time we could really control the magnetic field beyond the coil. We could place it wherever we wanted to in this space. The challenge was is that the electric field and magnetic field will still were still pretty tightly coupled. And so while we could transfer you know, tens of watts of power, it was only really safe to transfer up to a watt of power if humans were in that space. So we thought to ourselves, how can we turn this kind of far field-esque problem into a near field problem. How can we separate the electric field from the magnetic field so that we could keep the electric field, say, safe in capacitors while the magnetic field was swirling around the chamber? And so to do that, we had to kind of rethink about what is happening in that cavity resonator and how can we control the flow of current so we can disrupt it with these capacitors to control it with these circuit elements. And so uh, here is a, a basic simulation. We've turned the, the field orientation on its side, so now it's swirling around the center of the room, the space. We see there's a null in the center. And that magnetic field is driving current through the inside walls as it collapses. And we can see the current distribution on the walls here. I've only shown the top for simplicity. But we can see the magnetic field is driving current up to the top of the the uh, space, the cavity resonator. And here we see the charge distribution. And well, the charge is actually collecting at the top, so we can almost see this is already starting to look like a capacitor. So we have a null, a, a, a null in the center of the magnetic field, and current being driven up to the top and bottom of these cavity resonators. So here is our challenge. How do we take this effect and disrupt the current flow to control it and make this a near field cavity resonator. So our idea was, let's place a pole in the middle of that null because there's no magnetic field going here. And now that all the current is traveling up to the top, can we get it to travel up and then down in that pole and control it with a capacitor? And by tuning, increasing the capacitor, we can lower the resonant frequency of the room, okay? And so here's a console simulation of uh, the resulting current distribution, magnetic field distribution. We're only showing um, on the back walls and floors for simplicity, the current distribution. But we can see that it flows up through the walls into the ceiling and into the pole and it's getting stored in those capacitors. And that current flow results in a magnetic field that swirls around the room. As that magnetic field collapses, it drives current into the pole up back up into the walls. So here we see that we're storing magnetic fields in a room and we're storing electric fields in a capacitor. We've made an oscillator that oscillates back and forth. All right, so now we had a kind of a console model, a theoretical model. We wanted to go build something and we didn't want to make a little tiny little chamber, so we made a room. 
So here's a 16 foot by 16 foot by seven and a half foot room. The geometry doesn't matter that much as, um, as I'll talk about later, but this was just what was easy from a building material point of view. Um, we used capacitors in this pole here to lower the frequency to 1.32 megahertz. So here we're operating in the deep subwave Wave, sub wavelength region. So normally we have wavelengths that are hundreds of meters and we'll be able to confine it into this chamber um, and we're able to effectively separate the electric field from the, from the magnetic field. What's particularly interesting here is that the quality factor of this room is 2200, which is kind of amazing for 1.3 megahertz. Normally if you had a coil of wire, you're happy if you get in the hundreds, uh, if you have a quality factor in the hundreds. Okay, so let's go through a quick demonstration. Here, I have that signal generator going to an amplifier. It's going to feed about 10 watts, let's say, into this room, and we have a coil. This coil is going to couple into this resonator that we uh, described before, and it's going to fill the room with, wire, uh, with magnetic fields. That's gonna cause current to flow up through the walls, floors, and ceiling and into the uh, pole here and into those capacitors, which is gonna flow out and then we're gonna store energy in the room as magnetic fields and electric fields in the capacitors. Okay, so here's uh, one of my former postdocs, Matt Chibalco. He has a coil of wire, an LED, and a little tuning capacitor. So there's no batteries on that thing. And he's just showing you where the electric field, it goes to the bottom, it goes to the floor, to the pole, to the wall. And as he walks around, you can see that it's everywhere in this room. He does do a little trick right here. You're gonna see he flips the, the coil around a little bit just as he, as he walks through to keep it lit. That's not to deceive you. That's actually one of the challenges of this work is that you have to have your coil and the orientation to catch those that magnetic field. So if your coils are orthogonal to the field, none of that flux is gonna uh, go through the coil and charge your device. There's lots of ways around it. One is to have multiple orthogonal coils. Other one is to control the field distribution, uh, which we have another paper on. All right, so we can do more than LEDs. We can do real things. So here is a, a fan. We've taken the batteries out, put coils around the inside of the chamber or inside of the, um, the case. And when we turn on the room, to the power to the room, we see that the fan turns on. And of course, again, as we turn it orthogonal in this case, the fan turns off. And of course, we wanna get back to that vision of a wirelessly powered cell phone in your pocket, so we can do that as well. You saw the coil on the back. Now with any good wireless power uh, uh, delivery demonstration, it, that's actually super boring. In fact, here we've charging this device and all this really happened um, here is that this icon has changed. Now there's a thunderbolt, woo, wow, right? Um, but this is in fact showing that the system works properly. All right, so a little bit about the theoretical model. It was quite a trick to get a good closed form analytic solution for this. What we had to realize is that of course, if you have a, a current flowing through a wire, you can, uh, you can uh, um, calculate the magnetic field if you just use the right hand rule, but we had to account for the mirror images. So here, because there's a metal wall here, we see a negative current on the other side, and those negative currents also induce a positive current. So we have these second order effects here. So once you account for all the mirror images and mirrors of the mirror images, then you can get a pretty good approximation for the field distribution. Once you have the field distribution, you can put a virtual coil in that thing, see how much flux is captured, and then calculate, have a closed form solution to calculate the power transfer. And so we did that, and we also did simulations and uh, measured results. And here you can see the, the um, theoretical uh, values for the mesh. Indeed, there is a null by the walls because we have a circular magnetic field in a square room. We have a classic square room or square uh, hole round peg problem here. Um, but for the fields, for the majority of the room, you get lots of wireless power transfer. In fact, we can show here along this line that our simulations in COMSOL along with our analytical and our measured values all agree very well. And we're getting high power transfer efficiency. And this is Gmax, which assumes there is good impedance matching. We also looked at safety because it's important to ensure that your, uh, you know, your ideas, your research has legs. You don't want to go down dead ends. 
So we did a basic uh, simulation to look at the FCC's limits on electric field strength and volts per meter. This is the call to action. And once you've reached this limit, then you need to do a specific absorption rate measurement, a SAR measurement, to figure out how much energy the body's absorbing. And so we got um, MRI scans of a human, uh, annotated the organs with the correct electrical properties at this frequency 1.32 megahertz, put them in simulation, and then looked at the uh, limits for one gram um, maximum absorption. Here is 1.5, 1.6. And we showed that the green shows the valid regions where you would be safe. And we see that there's this dependency on how, if the room is sending power to a coil, most of that energy is going to the coil, then there would be a higher permissible level. Um, amazingly, if you look here, if you're like 95% efficient, you could hit 1.9 kilowatts of power transfer uh, before you hit the SAR limits, which is amazing. However, nobody would really do that, right? And I wouldn't propose that. When I look at this um, chart, I get excited about this end. This says, even if I do the worst case scenario, I have a transmitter or a room that's not even talking to the receiver, not even checking to see if power is going, you can send up to 100 watts of power, and that's real usable power before you hit a safety limit. Likewise, even the basic restrictions here at 30 watts, this gives me confidence that there's enough headroom in this idea that we could pursue it if we wanted to. All right, so now what are we gonna do when we have this pervasive field all around us? What else can we do other than just basic power transfer? Well, how about we use this magnetic field as a communication medium? Here we have a receiver. Um, we can have the room talk to the receiver through AM modulation, so you can just modulate the magnetic field. The coil or the, or the IoT node can transmit information back using load modulation, right? By shorting and receiving or opening uh, a switch, it can accept or reflect energy back. This is very similar to, to um, a near field RFID. We can also add other receivers in the room, which can talk to the room, but they can talk to each other because the coupling in here is so strong through this uh, high Q resonator that the nodes can actually talk to each other directly. So we built a, uh, a device to check this, to explore this idea. We have antennas and a step down transformer. We have an encoder to switch out or to short out the antenna. We have a receive decoder um, this is using on-off keying, right, to decode. And we have an adaptive and dynamic adjusting threshold so that we can look at the variations from the room as well as the smaller variations from the other nodes. And here we're, of course, capable of bi-directional communication. So we looked at the bit error rate, and as you would imagine, uh, the bit error rate is relatively slow, um, or small, the room is much better at transmitting information because it can turn the field off and on. It has the big hammer. It can turn the field off and on while the nodes are loosely coupled to the room and don't have as much ability to influence the room. So their bit error rate is higher. In all cases, you can do a few kilobits per second, which is generally good for IoT nodes. It's also important to look at here is the frequency distribution. Remember, it is super narrow. The Q of this room is 2200 unloaded. So that means you have a very narrow window to push data through. So it's no surprise that your bit error rate is uh, not as great as you would expect for other mediums, but good enough for sensor nodes. We also looked at power um, charging. Uh, so we uh, made a power management module consisting of a rectifier, voltage regulator, battery charger, a LiPo battery, and a voltage regulator for the MCU on this device. And so, um, like we showed before, there is the rotation issue, right? You have to be uh, in good rotation, but still, given how much power this we can send out safely, you're pretty much always guaranteed to get some amount of power to your device, even if you're only trickle charging. And there is a very small bandwidth. And so we were able to show that we could simultaneously charge 10 devices throughout a room, randomly placed, and they were not only able to charge, but they were able to talk to each other. All right, so with that, I'll, I'll conclude. Um, you know, quasi-static quasi -static cavity resonance offers a wireless power transfer for really large volumes. Um, 
What's interesting is it allows you to transfer power to small coils. Normally, if you're looking at inductive coupling or, or magnetic coupled resonance, everything has to be about the same size. Here we have very asymmetric coils, which is interesting. We're able to safely deliver tens to hundreds of watts of power, and we can simultaneously charge tens to hundreds of devices. Um, and again, we're not limited to what can fit right next to a coil. We do require these specially designed rooms, and I think there's lots of research to be done to figure out how to optimize these rooms and spaces. And I think these are just early days for this uh, type of wireless power transfer, and there's still lots of space to innovate and discover, and I encourage you, if you're interested, uh, to, to get engaged and reach out to me. I'm happy to discuss. Um, so with that, I'll conclude, and those are our references. Thank you for listening.